Uh, we're going to dive in and talk about predicting influence and communities using graph algorithms. Now, you might ask why you would want to do that. And there's, there's several different um, use cases for doing that. But if we think about predicting influence, you know, very simply, if you wanted to make a recommendation, um, what do the influencers in that community do? Uh, what, uh, what do they buy? What might they recommend? So that's a very simple explanation of, of why you might be interested in influence. Sorry, some mic issues. But um, another thing on communities, uh, not related to commercial, but you might be trying to understand fraud or fraud rings. So there are several community detection algorithms, and there are some that we'll talk about that help you not only find communities, but dial up and dial down thresholds so you can fine tune what you need. So in the next 40 minutes, we're going to talk a little bit about graph analytics and why they're different uh, for predictions in general. Uh, we're going to talk about influence with centrality algorithms, and we're going to talk about communities with community uh, detection algorithms. Uh, my name's Amy Hodler. Um, this is my colleague, Soren Reichard, and uh, we'll be with you for the next few minutes. If you're interested in AI and machine learning talks, there's a couple sessions later today, uh, 3.40 and 4.30 as well, that talk a little bit about that in a, a larger, um, a larger uh, a view. What we're going to talk about today, most of it is covered in a book that was just published last week. It's an O'Reilly book. You can get it on neo4j.com. Um, I will show this again at the end, so you can grab the URL if, uh, if you're interested in it. Now, very simply, I just actually a quick question. How many of you are already working with a graph of some sort? Oh my God, I love that. That's just fantastic. Um, so, so most of you know, you know, graphs are kind of all around us. For those of you who aren't working with graphs already, you can think of graphs as the mathematical representation of your networks and of course of complex systems. And that could be anything from a logistics system, it could be a physical system like a transportation network, but it could also be a biological functions as well, a traffic flow. So anything where you have nodes and entities connected and having relationships to something else can be represented as a graph. Now, if we think about um, graphs in general, what we've seen uh, in EO4J over time is that customers use uh, graphs in a variety of different ways. They usually start off a little more simplistically, just connecting things that are very similar and doing analysis. Then they try to get a little more complex and look for contextual paths. Um, then they layer on and cross-connect different types of items, so products and customers, uh, looking at um, different types of genes and diseases and drugs, and so they get more complex, and then they start to layer on graphs. And this is kind of an interesting evolution that we see that you may start simple, but most people who start down the graph path continually add different layers and um, get more out of the data that they already have. So one of the questions that we get a lot of is that graphs are cool, I like them, but how do I know whether the problem I'm looking at is actually a graph analytics problem, something that I might want to use with, um, with algorithms? And there's usually three different major buckets. One of them is just understanding how things uh, propagate through a network. So you can think of that as like disease propagation or traffic propagation. Um, flow, sometimes related to that. Uh, what is, happens when I do a constraint to my network? Do things flow in another direction? Very relevant if you do IP or, or um, telco kind of routing. And then interactions and resiliency. Probably more re related to uh, what we're talking about today. And that's a lot of community detection, a lot of influence with the community, trying to understand how things may um, either break apart or become more cohesive in the, in the future and how links might be predicted in the future. And all of those things have in common the need to understand the structure and the topology of your data. Now, one of the things that's kind of frustrating is, as many of us uh, play around with our data, is it's not neat. Um, our data is lumpy, it's messy, it looks something like this. Um, we can see that there are patterns. This is actually a picture of um, some of the networks in the World Wide Web, just a small portion. Um, but we can't actually suss out the patterns by just looking at it. 
And so the tendency is often to take an averages approach. Like, hey, I've got all this customer data. I'm not sure what to do. I'm just going to kind of average things out. And when you do that, you're looking at the number of nodes here uh, on the x-axis, relationships, how many relationships are in the y. Just assume that it must be, in general, everything has four connections or whatever the number is. And so you get this kind of Gaussian curve there. Um, but what we knew, know from network science is there is no network in nature that actually looks like this. So if we follow this kind of approach, we know that we're going to be missing information. We know already it's not going to be correct. Um, what we generally see instead is this kind of a distribution. And so you can kind of see up and to the left, there are, some, there are a few nodes with a lot of connections. Those are kind of your hubs. And then towards the bottom, there are a lot of nodes with very few connections. We see this over and over again. Um, it follows kind of a quasi-power law distribution. And you can imagine the implication of this, if you are taking an approach that looks at that kind of average of, of, of your network data and just assuming that's the way things are, you're missing both the strategic influential items and up and to the left, those hubs, uh, and you're also missing where most of your nodes or your customers or your genes actually live. And so you're both missing the top end and the popular slow end. Um, so what you can do with graph algorithms, they help you extract that structure and infer behavior. So these are just a couple pictures from um, different areas of academia. The middle one is a grass food, lin, uh, food web using uh, PageRank and some other community detection. And there's also the ability to kind of infer separation in the future or uh, potential missing links. So, so that's why graph algorithms are really quite unique because they're based on the mathematics of relationships. And I think Soren can tell us a little bit more about finding patterns within that data. Yeah, hey. So um, if you want to extract uh, data from your graph, you basically end up with uh, two possibilities. Uh, you can see on the left um, the query site, which means you already know what you are looking for in your graph, and you query the graph, and eventually you get uh, results back. Um, and uh, this is a more local view on the graph, while on the other side, on the graph algorithm side, um, we treat uh, the graph as a kind of a global view, and we we essentially trying to find uh, out what the graph is looking like. So what are the, the key nodes, what are important nodes, and uh, what is the overall structure of the, of the graph? And that's uh, why we're using graph algorithms. And we compiled a list of um, different algorithms here for you. So um, on the left side, you can see more classic algorithms. So you will see uh, path finding in the top left. And this is uh, actually algorithms like uh, shortest path, which uh, most of you should have known, I think. And uh, on the right side, there uh, are a few not so well known, like uh, link prediction, which uh, is the probability of two nodes um, to form a relationship in the future. However, in this talk, we will uh, be concentrating on the centrality algorithms, which uh, means uh, how, uh, so we want to extract how important uh, a node is in a graph, or community detection algorithms, which are essentially clustering algorithms. And we have a few. Um, offerings for that, so in the Spark and Neo4j world. So on the uh, left side, you can see coming with Spark's uh, 3.0, the community voted to have a Cypher in the basic repository of uh, Spark. So coming in August, um, whenever you download uh, Spark, um, you will get uh, Cypher query capabilities and a property graph model in, in Spark. In the middle, you can see um, a thing called uh, Morpheus. This is actually the um, the program I'm working on at Neo4j with my team. And uh, Morpheus is all about um, having tables distributed in different data sources and weaving them together to form graphs. So um, we will actually um, creating a Cypher compiler which compiles down to um, Spark SQL uh, to get this further rate querying. So if you're interested in either of those, um, you can visit uh, another technical talk of us which is interviewing table and graph data in Spark which talks about uh, Spark 3.0 and Morpheus, uh, which is uh, today, 2.30 p.m. in room uh, 2015, uh, 14. So, um, however, if you want to uh, leverage the full capability of graphs and the full power of graphs, uh, you should choose a native graph platform that uh, is built from the ground up to serve uh, graphs. And uh, this is what Neo4j offers. So our newest offering is a graph algorithms platform, and we have 
something about more than 40 algorithms or something okay. that you can that yeah. you can uh, run in this platform. <coughs> so today we uh, prepared a few examples for you, and uh, we are using a Game of Thrones dataset, which is um, a dataset uh, you can find at this GitHub link on the top. And actually, the data is extracted by looking at what are names in the text uh, of the TV show. And uh, if another name occurs, uh, occurs within 15 words from the first, um, uh, it's two nodes with the names and the relationship that co is called uh, interacts. So this is basically our graph. And we are looking at um, this graph um, on the one hand using Spark. So we are using Spark um, graph frames, which is uh, or which will be deprecated in favor of the new Cypher offering coming in August. But um, today we have a look at the Scala API of this. And on the other hand, we are looking at the Neo4j platform. So uh, we have uh, two apps there. We have the desktop app, which is a nice UI, and also the algorithms playground, where you can choose algorithms and run them. And. So, so we're going to start off with um, a couple algorithms that you can help um, or that will help with your um, community detection and just it's a really nice way to start off uh, evaluating your data um, triangles clustering coefficient um, there's a couple different ways you can use these algorithms you can use them just to understand your network in general um, do you have a small world structure um, does, do people remember uh, seven degrees of separation six degrees of separation Anybody play the Kevin Bacon game or the Urdash? Okay, so, so you guys know about small world structures. So it can help you evaluate um, whether your, your network data has such a thing and, and the behavior associated with it. But you can also do things like estimating stability, so things that are more cohesive are more likely to stay together, um, finding structural holes, so potentially holes in your network where there should be connections or you might possibly be able to introduce connections um, to introduce two different groups. Um, you can also use uh, triangles and clustering coefficients to score for other uh, uses. Uh, they're very commonly used in machine learning, so you score how tightly a node is, and then you can, then you can put that score into your other machine learning pipeline. Quick example has to do with spam classification, where they basically use semi-streaming data coming off web pages, looking and trying to analyze whether these web pages as a, an individual node were extremely highly connected to other web pages and estimating with the clustering coefficient whether that might potentially be a spam web page or an erroneous web page. Now, the way um, triangles and clustering coefficients work is pretty simple. Um, if you can imagine, we're just talking, in this case, you can, you can globalize um, any of these, but in this case, we're just looking at node U in the middle, how many triangles go through it, and then the clustering coefficient looks at um, the triangles over, as a percentage over the number of possible triangles. What clustering coefficient really gives you is what's the probability that the nodes associated and around um, you, in this case, uh, are to be connected. So in the one uh, with the clustering coefficient of 0.2, that basically means that the neighbors of you have a 20% probability of being connected as well. So, and I think we have uh, a little demo on that, don't we? Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> So this demo is uh, going to be run in uh, Spark with graph frames. And um, let me start this real quick. Hope this doesn't pop up too much. Uh, sorry. Um, so what we can see here, um, we are um, running actually two algorithms, because graph frames doesn't offer a clustering coefficient as a standalone algorithm. But this is not a problem, because it's a pretty easy algorithm. So we are running triangle count on the uh, one hand. And we are running a degree count on the other hand. And with those two values, we need to join them back together to have them in one row together for each node. And um, afterwards, we are doing some pretty easy arithmetic uh, operation to see um, the clustering coefficient. As I guess many of you are more used to Python than Scala. But I think um, both APIs look quite similar. So um, that's why I chose uh, Scala here. And, and you have to tell them what, uh, what series, what TV series oh, we ran actually, on. actually, yes. Um, this, yeah. is, this is the second, second season second of season. Uh, Game okay. of Thrones. So uh, yeah, you, will, you will see characters that will uh, die later. So spoiler alert. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so 
So, and so I find this really interesting that some of these characters have a high degree. So let's say, um, oh, uh, here is Caitlin. Um, yeah. You know, some of them have high degrees, so they have a lot of connections, but their clustering coefficient isn't high. So that would say I have a lot of relationships at a single hop out, but my friends aren't very friendly with each other. So that's one way to interpret that. Yeah. That could mean that you're either traveling much in Game of Thrones or you are between different parties and they probably fight each other. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. What do we got next? Closeness centrality. Um, that's a fun algorithm. So you want to use closeness centrality when you're trying to understand how to disseminate information or how, how resources might spread. Um, it's also been used for understanding how diseases spread and the likelihood of things to spread in a community. Uh, it's really nice when uh, you have weighted relationships that can help you evaluate interaction speeds as well. Um, it's often been used as a heuristic for logistics and um, arrival times. Um, the example uh, that I have here, a little more serious example, uh, but in te uh, terrorist network uh, analysis, they've actually used closeness centrality to understand uh, who in that network might be able to acquire more information, either help spread it on our behalf or acquire it on our behalf and, and target that. So some very, um, very real world use cases there. Um, closeness centrality basically looks at what nodes have the smallest distance to all other nodes, which makes sense. What can it reach the fastest? How many hops, or if you're using weights, maybe an actual um, physical distance or time difference. So I think that's a pretty easy to understand, and I think you were gonna talk a little bit about the API, yeah. Yes. Um, so I prepared this um, algorithm also in, uh, in Spark, and um, yeah, this algorithm also isn't available uh, off the shelf in, in GraphFrame, so we have, you have to rebuild it, but this one is a bit more complicated. It's actually a lot more complicated, and um, you can see here you have to define a lot of UDFs, and um, yeah, it's not so easy to understand what's going on there. And actually, it doesn't run on my machine because it's a re really uh, heavy to compute uh, algorithm. You have to compute um, shortest path between all pairs of nodes, which is uh, pretty heavy even for smaller graphs. But the interesting part uh, about this is um, we were using aggregate messages for, um, for uh, building this uh, algorithm. And uh, I will quickly explain uh, what this is. So um, does anybody of you have heard of the Pregel API? A couple. Okay, a couple, not so many. So um, aggregate messages is an implementation of uh, Pregel. I won't go too much into detail, but this is essentially, essentially a framework where you can um, define programs that run on graphs. So um, you uh, have, uh, for every vertex in your graph, you will run a program that computes a value inside a vertex, so to speak. And after you computed it, you will send it out to all your neighbors uh, via either out, ingoing, or both edges. And um, so every vertex then gets um, several messages and you have to define how to merge those messages either into an array or into a scalar value. And afterwards, um, you can compute a new value with this value. And uh, this is divided into super steps that uh, parallelize pretty well. And uh, this is just like a high level overview. Um, so with this mindset, you can, you can start creating your own algorithms and implement them. Yeah, and I think the key takeaway there is even if there's not an algorithm in the library today that you, you know, that you want to use, if there's something you want to use, there are methods for you to actually implement it um, in Spark. Yes. Yeah. Oh, page rank. My goodness. Um, I've never met an algorithm that had a fan club uh, until page rank. Um, if you're trying to understand, so I assume, is there anybody who hasn't heard of page rank? One person, okay. So PageRank was developed by Larry Page um, to understand the, and used by Google to understand credibility and make uh, recommendations on what web pages to serve up. Um, anytime you're looking at a broad influence over a network, this is kind of a nice one to start at. There's a lot of um, uh, properties that you can use to tweak as well. There are domain-specific versions of this. There's personalized page rank, which is often used for recommendations because you're, hopping, you're always hopping back to a set of nodes. 
Um, one interesting, or I guess two interesting examples, um, the personalized page rank is used in the what to follow service for Twitter. Um, there's also, page rank has also been used for things like uh, fraud detection and feature engineering uh, for later machine learning. And basically in the fraud detection, they were looking for uh, overly influential uh, doctors in subscriptions of opioids actually. So um, if you're interested in that, I actually have the, the research on that. It's a really important use case, I think. Um, page rank and the way it calculates is it actually looks at the um, incoming or the uh, directional links and gives you gives node scores on those links, but not just on those links, also on the score of the node linking to it. And you can think of this, what, the way I like to think about uh, page rank is that uh, it might be, it, you might be a, let's say a major in, a, in, a, in the army and have a lot of, you know, feel like you have a lot of influence uh, and you have a lot of people probably, you know, asking you uh, and referring to you for credibility. But if you're a major that has the ear of a general, your page rank is gonna go up significantly. So basically people acquire credibility, acquire influence by the people that give them credibility and influence. And I think we also have demo of PageRank. Yes, um, we have PageRank right here, and this time it's uh, present in the GraphRamps environment. And uh, let me start this real quick. So, so one thing to note is that's getting started. Um, you'll see uh, reset probability is what, logically, what Spark uses um, to talk about the dampening factor. A lot of papers, it was originally called a dampening factor, um, which is exactly the, um, the opposite of reset probability. Reset probability, um, they mean the same thing, they just use opposite measures. So reset probability is uh, basically the uh, one minus um, the dampening factor. Um, dampening factor does matter, it was developed with a probability associated with a power law, a very high power law distribution. If your network is a little more average, doesn't have that kind of distribution, you want to play with that um, dampening factor. So just a minor difference uh, to the Python API, actually in Scala you don't have um, those arguments in parentheses, but you get kind of a builder pattern after you call page rank. So when you want to use this in Python, you would call page rank parentheses and insert the arguments like dampening factor and tolerance value or maximum iterations. And uh, we know of the results and um, in a descending manner. And we can see right um, on the very top there's Varis. So if you recall um, the TV show, um, Varis is always, it's not a person that jumps into action or stuff, but he's a, a master manipulator. So he talks to very influential persons in order to manipulate them. Uh, them. So it totally makes sense that his uh, page rank uh, is pretty high because um, he is influential and he talks to influential persons. Yeah. And one caution on PageRank, as we're, we'll move off here in a second, is that PageRank is, looks at ranking things to each other. So mixing node types can sometimes uh, present nonsensical data. So if I were ranking um, a product and a person together, how does a product give a human credibility? How does a human give a product credibility? So usually you have same node type to same node type in PageRank. There are some implementations that, that mix, um, but that's uh, unusual and you don't see that in uh, Spark or um, uh, Neo4j either. So just to be careful with that, because you can do it, your results just won't look very good. Um, between us centrality, this is a fun one. Um, between us centrality is a lot of what the word between us means. You're looking to identify bridges. You're trying to uncover control points. You're trying to find bottlenecks and vulnerabilities within your network. There's a great study that actually looks at network resilience in an electrical grid in Europe. Um, you can probably guess what country. Uh, and basically what they did is they were having trouble with cascading outages. And they looked at actually adding in more node points and more travel, saying, hey, you know, if I need more resilience, I'm gonna add more paths, that'll be better. What they found out, using between the centrality and some other community detection algorithms, was it was actually better for them to remove some nodes 
and they were able to increase their robustness. And that was because the electrical outages were going through waves like information waves. It was like a cascading effect. So taking out some of those connectors actually improved their resilience. Um, so that's a couple use cases, and uh, the way between the centrality actually works. Um, I love this visual because it, this is, you know, in a small graph, this is often what you see. Um, but it's the sum of the percentage of shortest pass through a node calculated by each and every pair. Uh, and so it is, you know, bridges and control points is the way to think about this algorithm. Um, this can be a computationally intensive algorithm, so there are uh, approximation algorithms as well that you can use in place of them. Okay, and this time uh, we're gonna showcase this algorithm in um, Neo4j. So we, wait, actually um, have uh, two tools available. Um, so this one you see right here is um, Neo4j desktop. Um, there you can uh, administrate uh, databases and run queries and get uh, visual feedback. And um, the one you can see here is um, the newly released uh, Neuler program, which is uh, also called Graph Algorithms Playground, so you can just uh, click and find uh, algorithms and uh, run them. So we are gonna, I don't know, uh, is this kind of good visible? Um, so, so otherwise, um, I'm selecting between the centrality here, I'm choosing what label we are running this on, I'm choosing what um, relationship type we are running this on, and um, no, simply click run here. And we can see the result right here. And um, on the very top, there's um, Joffrey. So Joffrey is uh, king of King's Landing uh, at this season. And um, which also kind of uh, makes sense that he, he is a very important node because many conversations flow towards him and uh, maybe kind of end there, but he's also a connecting point between, between parties because uh, everybody wants to talk to the king, of course. Yeah. Great. All right. Um, so we have label propagation next. And label propagation, I feel like, is one of those algorithms that is just not appreciated enough. Um, it's very powerful. It, it scales nearly linearly with the number of nodes, so it's really good if you have large-scale networks. Um, it's great for initial clustering, pre-processing data, so it's attempting to classify things based on the neighborhood. Uh, and it's really good when you have less clear groups, like you're not really sure of your communities, but you can use weights, so it, it takes um, great advantage of, of weighting as well. Um, there's an interesting example using um, graphs and label propagation to look at drug combinations and whether they might be dangerous or not. They looked at chemical similarity and side effects between uh, genes, drugs, uh, and the likelihood that they may some of, the, some of those drugs might be prescribed together. Um, so just a really great way to get started with um, kind of your, your first level of community detection. Um, the way label propagation works is it basically a node looks at its neighbors and then starts to acquire the labels of those neighbors based on, especially if you're using weights, and you can weight either relationships and or nodes. Um, as I mentioned, it scales well, it parallelizes well, uh, if one of, the, one of the fun things about this algorithm that I really like is the ability for um, the use of seed labels. So you can actually use this as a semi-supervised uh, learning to seed what you know is gonna be influential in your network. Those nodes seed those with labels and they're more likely to propagate through your network. Yeah, um, <clears throat> next showcase, um, label propagation. So I'm um, going to start this again. And this one is also a pretty straightforward uh, algorithm, again, to, to call with in data frames. You just say graph.label uh, propagation, and you have to specify a maximum amount of iterations, uh, which uh, makes sense because this um, algorithm isn't uh, it's not deterministic. So this means, on the one hand, that um, you will end up with different results every time you run it slightly different at least, but what also can happen is that um, different groups uh, toggle each other uh, every iteration and you will end up in an infinite loop. And using those seed labels can help with, um, with that flipping and as, as well with the variation, variation of results. Yeah. So what we now see here is uh, kind of the, the clusters uh, which have uh, random label IDs and um, actually names clustered in it. 
And uh, these are not exactly um, distinct houses in the world of Game of Thrones, but maybe houses that, that uh, speak to each other um, very, very commonly. And um, I'm going to showcase the same in, um, in Neo4j. And going to select the same parameters as I did before. Click Run, and we get maybe similar results, but uh, we can't uh, grasp the information here. So visualization to the rescue. And um, now we have a lot better view on uh, what the clusters look like. For example, we can see here on the, on the right side, this is on the, on the other island in Game of Thrones, so they are completely um, disconnected to the other graph. You can see, of course, they talk very much to each other, and in the, or in the center we have, like, this is more King's Landing, and then the North, uh, they talk too much, uh, talk very much to each other. Yes. Yes. Go back. Yeah. All right. Um, so uh, another algorithm that is really quite interesting is Louvain modularity. Um, that actually, the, the first example I showed at the very beginning with the thresholds, that was actually using Louvain. Um, Louvain is really good uh, with community detection, again, at a, a large scale. Um, but it's also really good at cover, uncovering hierarchical relationships. Uh, and you'll see why in the, the next slide. Um, this example actually was looking at hierarchical relationships of brain functions. So not only how are functions grouped, but how are subgroups and subgroups or subfunctions in this case related as well. Um, so mapping those was something they were able to do with Louvain. Um, it's also, uh, as I mentioned, really good for uh, setting thresholds. So you can set thresholds and look at um, something that's very near, so I don't want to say one hop, but something that's very near to a node or look farther out, and we can do those with intermediary, intermediary um, communities. So what Levain actually does is it continually maxi maximizes modularity. And modularity you can think of as an estimate of presumed accuracy. I like to just think of it as optimal grouping. So it's trying to, the algorithm's trying to find an optimal grouping of nodes. And it does this by comparing, almost does a what if analysis. If I move this node to this other group, does the uh, optimal grouping, does the density in both go up? Does it go up overall? Where do I need to move this, this node? Um, so it does that, and then, then it does, so that's kind of the first picture with the um, blue, green, yellow, the, the larger one. But then it takes another step, and it tries to group those into super groupings and then does that again, and does that again, and does that again. And so in a way, it kind of smashes groups together. Um, I have a friend that actually explains it as looking kind of like how far out from my arm's reach do I want to go? Do I want to look at communities that are really close to me, or do I want to go farther out and farther out and farther out and consume those uh, basically tertiary uh, communities as, as well? So yeah, um, I think this is the last demo, and we are going to show this in Neo4j again, but this time not with this um, click tool, but uh, in the actual browser, and we can see, um, wait, let me bring this up again. So the thing on top is the actual query in Cypher, which is uh, the Neo4j graph querying language, and uh, we are calling the uh, Louvain algorithm here. And um, it takes parameters similar to the ones I inserted in the um, graph play go on. So we are specifying the node label and the, uh, inter so the relationship type. And uh, in the curly braces, we are just inserting some random config uh, parameters, like number of cores you can imagine, uh, also on the other screen. And uh, what we get back here is actually um, the name of the node. Then in the middle, it's the community they end up with after running the algorithm, and we have um, um, kind of the, the transition through the iterations of the algorithm and uh, the intermediate uh, communities uh, they, they are in. So um, if we look at uh, Rob, for example, Rob um, started off in community five, and uh, so basically you can imagine this is a community, and in the next iteration, you look at a bigger circle around the community and try to like, uh, squeeze those into your community, and uh, this worked for the second iteration as well. But on the third iteration, um, I mean, he ended up in, in community three, so that means that uh, community three was a much bigger community from the beginning, and it's, it expanded its uh, circle, kind of. It is like a way of visualizing it, and then uh, kind of ate. <laughs> 
this community he, he was in. The one thing to note with this algorithm is that sometimes you do lose small communities because we are eating the smaller communities or you're smashing them together. Um, so we have a lot of people that actually double check and look and prefer to look at an intermediary community as opposed to the final community. Um, the final thing with this algorithm is it also plateaus. You can get different results in multiple um, iterations. Uh, that happens with all modularity algorithms, and that's just the nature of trying to optimize both locally and globally as well. I Back think, to you. Is that? I think that's end of demo. Okay, so there's a couple resources that we get asked a lot for. Um, data set collections, I need test data sets. Um, so I've got some of those on the, um, on the left here. Um, the Spark community, Neo4j community, lots of references there as well um, that you can use to get started. Um, the data set collections are pretty popular and those reference other data sets. And then there's some reference data sets for testing as well there that we've got. Um, so I think we've got four minutes for questions. Um, I do understand that people need to go to the mic so everybody can hear them. So if you have a question, jump to the mic. Hi, I have a question for you. Um, my name's Sarah. I work at a really small company right now. We're a startup and we found that a lot of the support on Spark or for Neo4j works great, but then there's some things that in NetworkX, which is very popular in academia and locally, are already implemented. And um, we're trying to use as much already implemented code as possible, and I'm wondering if you have suggestions for how to use and take advantage of some of the local processing, for example, like closeness centrality already exists in NetworkX, how to do that if it's by finding subgraphs using community detection or... Yeah, so, so there's a couple different, NetworkX is a fantastic resource. They have a lot of um, algorithms. Um, we find that when people need to scale um, to larger data sets, they tend to switch to a, um, a more enterprise platform, uh, Spark, Neo4j, you know, other things as well. Um, if you want to implement something uh, in Spark that doesn't exist there today, um, Soren showed you a couple ways to do that. Definitely check out the aggregate message. Uh, and then in Neo4j, the closeness centrality, we have some approximation ones as well that you can, uh, that are already implemented in Neo4j. Um, come visit us at the booth and we can kind of get down into the, the weeds on what you specifically need. All right, no other questions. We answered everything. Oh, one more question. Download the book. We go through a lot more detail in the book. And please, your question. I actually just started the book. It's really good so far. But, awesome. Um, uh, with Spark 3.0 and Cypher coming into that, will you have access to the implemented machine learning algorithms within Cypher as well? Um, I don't think within Cypher, but um, I think uh, Databricks um, is planning to, to get the, the API compatible to the old data uh, graph frames. So um, you can get a graph in the new Cypher um, module and you can uh, then fall back to, I think, the old algorithms in GraphX. I'm not sure how this will work, but it will work. Well, wonderful. Thank you, everybody, for your attention. Come visit us, visit us at the booth if you have more questions and in our later sessions as well.